maybe I could ask you to start out by telling us at what point you knew uh, you wanted to be a writer. My parents used to say that I would say that I wanted to be a writer when I was 10 or 11 years old. I actually don't remember it, but they, that's what they said. That when, when friends would say, what do you want to do when you grow up? I didn't want to be an astronaut or a sportsman. I wanted to be a writer, they said. So what does that mean? I don't know what it means when you're 11 years old if you say you want to be a writer. I think it means that you like being a reader. You know, I think it means that, that I loved books as a kid. I loved reading them and living in those worlds. And I think that's what it means. I wanted to be part of that world that I loved to be in as a reader. How do you feel when you complete a new book, publish it and everything, and you have millions of people telling you that it's an amazing book, but you read one review yeah. and it's a bad review? Uh -huh. how, do, how does that make you feel? You always remember the bad reviews. You, for, <laughs> you forget all the good reviews but you memorize the bad reviews and you want to kill people slowly and with pain <laughs> who, who wrote them. Um, but then there's also a moment in your life when you get over that. You know? I mean, there's a, it, one of the great things about doing this job for a while is that you begin to be clear about what, is it, what it is that you want to do, you know, what it is that you're trying to do, where you're trying to go as a writer. You begin to have a better sense of that. And, then after, and you hope that you write those books that go where you want to go, that people will come along. You want everybody to come. It's much nicer if people like your books. You know? It's preferable, and you want that to happen. But then at a certain point, you realize you're never going to please everybody. And it doesn't matter how many people you please, there's going to be people you don't, who don't like it, or don't get it, or don't, you know, that's not the kind of thing that they're looking for as readers. You know? At that moment, the moment you realize you can't make everybody happy, you're free because then you just do what you're doing, and hopefully if enough people come along for the ride, and the rest of them, you know, the hell with them. You know, they could go somewhere else. That's why bookstores are full of different books by different authors. You know, you go find the writers that, that suit your taste as a reader. What do you want your readers to learn and feel through your writing? Learn is a difficult question because they're, because they're not, you know, they're not textbooks, they're not, they're not teaching books. They're, uh, their novels, and I don't like novels that preach at me, you know. Um, I, I want novels where I could ent lose myself in that world with those characters and enjoy being there, really. And what you learn along the way, I mean, it's, it's kind of up to you. You know, I'm not, I'm not pr particularly trying to teach you things. But, but one of the things I think that literature does is it opens up to you worlds which are not your world. And, and, but through the book, they feel like they become your world. I mean, I had read American literature before I ever came to America, you know, and, and I felt like my first knowledge of this country was through the writing of this country, you know, um, and so by the time I got here, I felt I knew something about it already because I'd read all these great American writers. You've been associated with Penn, the Writers Organization, mm -hmm. for the longest time. Mm -hmm. so, how are tyrant regimes in mm, Alif Bey, uh, which is the province of Luka, and Iran, the Soviet Union, the state of Arizona, how are they, f <laughs> <laughs> how are they fought by storytellers? How are they? How are they fought? fought. How are they combated by storytellers? By storytelling? Well, yeah, the state of Arizona, that's a rough Bad place. News. No. Then there's Kansas. Kansas, where you know, poor old Charles Darwin has a hard time. I often felt that the people of Kansas's opposition to the theory of, to, to, to Darwin was actually the disproof of Darwin's theory, because it showed that, that it showed that the fittest, the fittest do not always survive, <laughs> and that it is possible for natural selection to go in reverse. <laughs> Uh, and produce, you know, cancers. Um, but this is how storytellers defeat. Comedy is a very good weapon. Hmm. Um, tyrants always lock up the comedians first. Hmm. Because to be ridiculed is the worst fate. Um, satire 
and ridicule are what tyrants fear, fear more than anything else, you know, to be made to look ridiculous. And one of the reasons that Penn has such great success when it focuses on this or that writer in trouble in this or that country and makes that, makes that writer the, the, you know, the, the center of their activity is that tyrants have this unusual desire to be popular. You know, they, they want to be loved. And when the world is telling them that they are not loved because of their behavior towards writer X, it's actually very often easier for them to release that writer so that people stop being nasty to them. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous how many times just turning the spotlight on, on, a, on such an abuse has resulted in the ending of that abuse because the despots concerned hate the spotlight. They hate the spotlight falling on their misdeeds. And Penn has been brilliant at doing that, brilliant at doing that, especially from this very stage. Actually. From this very stage, during the Penn World Voices Festival, we would always keep an empty chair next to whoever was speaking in order to remind the audience of the writers who could not be there. You know? And it's a, it's a great thing that Penn does, and I'm proud to be part of it. <laughs>